the International Association for Saudi Arabia, um, for those that don't know, know too much about us, promotes research relating to the Arabian Peninsula, and in particular its archaeology, history, epigraphy, languages, literature, art, culture, ethnology, geography, geology, and natural history. It, it does so by um, awarding research grants, uh, producing its own publications, and supporting others, uh, disseminating news about research in the peninsula, and organizing uh, lectures and conferences. Our major event is the Seminar for Arabian Studies, uh, which is being, I think we're, we're about to go to our 55th, I think it is, um, uh, next year in, in, in Berlin. It's the only international forum for the presentation of the latest academic research on the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, we just had the 2021 seminar, which took place over two weekends in July with Casa Arab uh, in Cordoba in Spain as our virtual host. Uh, the 2022 seminar will be held in Berlin. Uh, dates will be uh, announced shortly. Full date details of all our events are uh, at h or at www.theiasa.com. And we welcome new members and the website will tell you how to join if you'd like to do so. Um, the lecture is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel in, within a few days. Um, I'm now going to hand over to uh, uh, David, uh, to Derek Kennett of the University of Durham, uh, who will introduce Peter, Peter McGee. Uh, Derek. Thank you very much, Noel. Well, um, I have to say it's a great pleasure uh, for me to, to be asked to introduce um, Peter, Dr. Peter McGee, Professor Peter McGee, <clears throat> an old friend of mine. Uh, I can remember um, Peter turning up in the Emirates back in the early 90s, um, uh, working on Dan Potts' excavations at Telebrak. Uh, he followed that with his own excavation project at Mawela in Sharjah territory of a very significant Iron Age site. And since went back to, to the very significant site of Telebrak to try and untangle the um, Iron Age and Bronze Age chronology of the region. And through all of this, he's really, I think it's fair to say, established himself as one of the most significant, if not the most significant scholar of prehistoric Southeastern Arabia, and it's a great pleasure uh, that he's joy, uh, agreed to come and talk to us today about his work. He's um, been director of the Zayed National Museum in Abu Dhabi for the last three years, uh, since 2019. And he also serves as head of archaeology and paleontology within the DCT with the, the Department of Culture and Tourism in Abu Dhabi. Um, as I mentioned, he's, he's led heritage projects in, in the UAE and, and beyond since uh, 1994. For 20 years, he was a professor and then chair of archaeology at Bryn Mawr College in the USA. And prior to that, he held academic posts in Belgium uh, and Australia. He's published extensively on the history of the UAE and Arabia, including the really significant Archaeology of Prehistoric Arabia that was published in 2014 by Cambridge University Press. He's received numerous grants and awards, including the Sheikh Mubarak bin Mohammed Award for Services to, the, to UAE Archaeology in 2017. And in 2018, he was elected Fellow of the Society of Antiquaries, well, the well-known uh, famous society, the learned society established by Royal Charter in 1751. He received his PhD from the University of Sydney in 1996, and he's achieved enormous amounts since then. Peter, we're very uh, honoured and pleased to have you here and looking forward to hearing your lecture. Thank you very much, Derek, for that very generous introduction. Gosh, I mean, that was a long time ago, the early 90s in the UAE. So um, we, 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 I think we have fond memories of that time. And um, I also want to thank the IASA for, for inviting me, um, of course, to give this lecture, but more important than that is the fabulously important work that they do to promote the study of, of the histories and culture and archaeology of the Arabian Peninsula. Um, without such organizations, it would be hard to imagine that there would be the wealth of intellectual academic research which exists and which we have seen develop so profoundly over the last two or three decades. So thank you to the institution, but um, and thank you, uh, Derek, for that introduction. I will now share my screen. Um, and I'll begin. I will turn my camera off, in fact. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll come back towards the end, um, but I think for now it would be okay if I 
Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to um, talk about Abu Dhabi's islands and the global Neolithic revolution. So really what, what, what this lecture is about is trying to position some fabulously important discoveries that have been made in the last 10 years within a sort of broader history of scholarship concerning the period from around 8,000 BC to about 5,000 BC, 4,000 BC, and trying to sort of understand why um, I, as the head of archaeology and paleontology and the director of Zion National Museum, I get very excited about these discoveries. I, I, think, I think we're only for want of a better archaeological cliche, we are only scratching the surface about what we're starting to see emerge on these islands. And I really want to um, also acknowledge that, you know, while I am discussing these, these discoveries today and my thoughts on them and, uh, and, and how they fit into a broader intellectual pattern, I am, I am heavily drawing upon all of the work that has been done by other people, um, including um, my colleague, Dr. Mark Jonathan Beach, um, uh, my colleague, Nora Hamad al Hamali, my colleague, Ahmed Al-Faki, also Richard um, Cutler, all of the people that I work with in Abu Dhabi who, who have spent so long in the field to, to make these discoveries. And I acknowledge and thank them for all of their contributions. Having said that, it, it might well be the case that they do not agree with everything I say. In fact, it almost certainly will be the case. So why is it significant? Well, um, this is a view of one of the houses on the island of Marawa. Um, and you could look at it and you could say, so what? Um, people are building houses. Um, is that a surprise? Well, of course, it is a surprise. It is a surprise that, that people were building houses at this time in this location. And in fact, within the sort of long array of human history, if we think us about us as being, you know, uh, um, modern humans maybe around and moving out uh, in, into the rest of the world 150, 200,000 years ago now, it seems, it's only really in the last sort of five to 7% of that time frame that people have made the decision to stop and to build a structure and to live in it. Um, it's not obvious. Um, there's nothing really obvious about doing this. People had, of course, been successfully moving around the landscape and had been doing quite well. So the decision to do this, to build structures, is not inevitable. There is no linear development towards this, this point in time. We have to contextualize it with all of the other factors, environment, social, economic factors, which are occurring at this time in the position in which that decision is made. The specific site that I'm talking about is um, a site called Marawa 11. Uh, it's on the island of Marawa. Um, here is a, a map showing the location of this island in reference to Abu Dhabi. And you can see um, also in reference to the other islands. So for example, Sudan ES to the west and Abu al Abiyad to the east. And then these islands, of course, sit out in the Gulf today. Um, th these were the subject of intensive survey in the early 2000s by the Abu Dhabi Island Archaeological Survey. And already in the early 2000s, there were discoveries of what seemed to be Neolithic occupation at MR11 and subsequent survey at MR1 um, it also revealed um, uh, potentially Neolithic discoveries and more recently at MR 2.5. So the first thing to say is that this is not an isolated single structure. This is part of a broader socioeconomic decision to build and to live in one place at a specific time. This is a view of the site um, most recently based upon the excavations that were conducted by Mark Jonathan Beach and Nora Hamad al um, in the in the in the most recent season. Um, so far we've identified about seven heaps of stones which probably represent structures or groups of structures. Um, it, these these are uh, as I'll discuss in a minute, these uh, represent um, uh, not single uh, cell units, they are, they are multi-unit complex buildings which have uh, a, a complex architectural um, history associated with them. So for example, in area A, something that was of course uh, uh, partly excavated um, um, some time ago and presented to the seminar in 2005, um, Seminar for Arabian Studies, recent excavations have revealed a much more complicated architectural arrangement. But what we can see already is that these, these buildings have multiple rooms, they have doorways, they have access, they have architectural complexity 
both spatial complexity indicated by the use of inside and outside space, the walls which you can see here, wall 102 and 66, for example, creating spaces, uh, extramural spaces, which would have been used for cooking and other activities. Uh, west of the image on your right, you can see that there is a, a, a chronological complexity to it as well. Um, so for example, we, we, we anticipate that continued excavations will show that there was a, a, a duration of occupation at these, um, at these sites. This, and, and rebuilding over time. I and mean, we can see this already clearly, there's a central, central building and then there's the abutting rooms to the west and the east. Although obviously you can see the way the structures about the main room, um, this could have of course been done a week later, or it could have been done a thousand years later, or maybe five hundred years later. But nonetheless, what we're clearly seeing is something which isn't just uh, a, a simple structure, and this become clear in our excavations in area A, and has also become clear in following excavations, most recently in area F, which is still very, very uh, much the subject of um, investigation, archaeological investigation. Um, but uh, uh, you can see excavations undergoing here, but we can see already that there are large rooms, um, room 11, one of the larger rooms on the site, and these ancillary rooms, but also areas of extramural activity spread to the south, as you can see by that blue line. Now, um, moving um, to areas B and C, which of course we see as um, uh, obviously given, given different titles, but um, are, are clearly part of the same structure. Um, area B was excavated prior to the excavation of Area C. Uh, area C at the time was one of the larger mounds on the site and then was excavated. Area C sits on the highest plateau of the, of the Marawa 11, uh, highest point of the Marawa 11 plateau. Um, it is to some extent slightly different um, than the surrounding structures. It seems to consist of um, a long central room, which we have um, collectively as a team, we've, we've entertained the possibility that, that this is some um, sort of uh, possible communal gathering spot, a place which is not um, um, nothing, which um, would uh, uh, maybe for the community to gather um uh, and to meet and discuss stuff and this this issue of of a community space is something i want to come back to when we sort of broaden the picture out a little bit and look more broadly at the middle east there's extensive areas of burning around this as well and of course that's open to interpretation it might be just uh everyday activities or it might be that there is some sort of special function associated with this structure. Nevertheless, what we're seeing just in these uh, three to four areas is a spatially uh, disparate or, or spread out structures. Um, the artifactual record from them is clearly indicating that they are within an archae archeological sense, contemporary, and, um, and there's several mounds to go. So we'll be adding a further picture to it. But of course, there's always, you know, archeologists are always drawn to what is visible on the surface. And one of the things that we will look at in the future is where is excavating in areas where there isn't obvious clusters of stones to see what, um, what exists in those, in those areas. How old is it? Well, um, we've, the archaeologists um, ha have, have really uh, focused hard on, on high precision radiocarbon dating, both high precision dating, but also looking carefully at, um, at, the, at the context of, of, the, of the charcoal sample. And we can see that the settlement existed already by 5,800 to 5,700 BC. Um, so it is significantly old. Um, and it's really, uh, it's pushing back both just in a general sense, the, the chronology of the Neolithic period in this part of the Arabian Gulf, but also it's pushing back the date of structures, um, uh, which is something which once again throws our attention into why, why now and why in this place. How more broadly does it fit within the uh, other evidence for um, the Neolithic in this part of Arabia? So of course we've known for a long time that there are scattered flint assemblages in coastal desert and inland sites, 
We know, of course, by the northwards migration of the intertropical convergence zone that there was more rainfall occurring at this time. Um, and this has led quite rightly to models emphasizing that nomadic pastoralism um, was the dominant and successful subsistence strategy. And this blended existing hunter-gatherer subsistence with the presence of domesticated animals such as sheep and goat and possibly cattle, although there's some new evidence on that, which is um, coming out, which I've certainly yet to digest, but which is interesting. Um, and, and this has sort of been the dominant way in which we understand what's going on in the region. And we know that this, this mode, this nomadic pastoralist mode was, was successful, right? We have insights from Jebel Buhais. We have relatively healthy people, um, absence of caries, the bioarchaeology indicates few cases of vitamin A, D, C or calcium deficiency. There was nutritional stress noted in children, but that's common. And the average female and male life expectancy was, as you can see on the screen, 33 to 36 to 40 is actually maybe a little bit higher than the fully sort of developed agricultural communities which existed to the north of the region. region. So generally that, that sort of subsistence created um, opportunities um, uh, for intergroup contact, for emerging identity, but, but seemed to have been successful. On the coast, um, until the uh, excavations of Marawi, we had found evidence for coastal occupation, but it, for example, similar to this one, or this example rather, from Dalma, where it's, it is, of course, it is a structure, it contains post holes, but it would be, um, and it might well have been, uh, you know, not just seasonal, um, but it doesn't have the intentionality, I would argue, that the structures that we are recording and finding on Marawa seem to indicate. Um, more broadly, then uh, another issue which needs to be uh, discussed is, is how does what we find um, on Marawa fit into the broader Arabian Gulf? We've looked, the, the lecture will be going out in concentric circles and ending somewhere um, north of Scotland <laughs> for a reason which will become maybe clear uh, um, later. Um, that, that uh, of course, the period from around 5500 BC, a little, a little bit later, was a period of when there was intense uh, maritime trade between um, uh, the Arabian littoral and southern Mesopotamia. And some of the sites, the more famous sites, of course, are, are noted on this map. Um, and we know that, that that material certainly was present in the, in the southern Gulf. Um, however, um, even though there is this stunning, really quite beautiful um, um, vase from Mesopotamia found at Marawa, um, and, and there is evidence for marked uh, interaction, um, fragments, this vase at Marawa, I, it cannot be considered that, in my opinion, um, that this trade was somehow a driver for people to establish houses. Um, I don't think the chronology works um, on one hand, and I also just don't think there is the evidence to support this as a motivating economic factor. Um, so if we if we move out from this, um, we can see our Marawa is, Marawa is uh, uh, unusual within southeastern Arabia. I think there'll be new discoveries announced soon, which, which indicate that other islands within that immediate area have, have remains. But um, uh, but it, it is also uh, relatively um, unusual in, in the Arabian Gulf. Of course, in the north of the Arabian Gulf on Kuwait, there is established settlements, um, but they are tightly connected with, with this moment of economic expansion or trade associated with the Ubaid period, something which, which cannot be said for um, Marawa. But if we move even beyond um, the um, Arabian Gulf, um, we have to look more broadly, of course, at uh, the whole Neolithic question in, in the Near East, and we cannot do this without, without at least briefly mentioning the person that defined the idea, in fact, of the Neolithic revolution, very Gordon Child, who in 1936 in his Man Makes Himself set out to show that this Neolithic period was one of the first, the first of the, the, the three major periods that he saw as transforming human society, of course. Um, the Neolithic period, then the urban period, and then he brought it into the Industrial Revolution. He saw that these centuries um, were important for food production, for creating surplus, and also for driving sedentism or, 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 or village life, if you like. Um, here he is um, with a teddy bear given to him by the students at a university in the Czech Republic when he visited there in the 1930s. Um, 
uh, he, he, he believed that this Neolithic period was absolutely critical. And, and shortly after he, he put forward his, his arguments, um, evidence was found in, in the Middle East, which sort of supported his ideas. Initially, of course, um, excavations of places like Jericho um, and, ja and Jamo, um, both sort of in the middle of the seventh millennium BC, um, indicated that, that this was important, um, this period of, uh, of, of emerging um, village life. Um, but now, of course, we know it even is, is, is much um, earlier. Um, and we know, for example, that the, these developments, or we think we know, we can observe, um, that these developments um, were occurring in a sort of broad crescent shape and adjoining areas in which there is a degree of fertility because of the amount of rainfall which does occur, and hence um, these uh, villages, agricultural villages emerging much earlier than um, Marawa, for example, the site of Jerf al Akmar in Syria. Um, and particularly interested in the site of Jerf al Akmar because I think there are parallels which can be seen um, in, in, um, uh, in places like Marawa, where, where, we, where we see here, for example, where there is a presence of a communal building in the center of it, obviously not similar in form, but maybe comparable um, in function. And in fact, generally within the Neolithic period um, in, the, in, in this broad region, there is an increased emphasis on looking at, 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 the, at, the, at the importance of community gathering um, at this time. Now, whether or not that's related to Marawa, Marawa is something I'll get to, but this Neolithic package from this region, so domesticated cereals, um, chickpeas, lentils, domesticated animals, obviously it spreads. And um, the question is, is it spreading south? If it, if it does spread south, how does it relate to what we see at Marawa? But it also spreads to the west and the north and the east. Um, and it spreads, uh, as we can see here, across the Mediterranean, um, the dates are all BP here. And of course, we can just see uh, as this moves across, uh, as across Europe and eventually um, gets to um, uh, the northern um, islands off the coast of Scotland, um, Scara Bray, um, for example, much later, but where we can see the presence of crops and animals which ultimately find their origin in this Neolithic revolution in the Near East. I'm showing Scara Bray because the point that I'm trying to make is that that package was adopted almost wholesale across the Mediterranean and into parts of Europe and into the northern, even the northern um, uh, islands off the coast of Scotland, such as Scara Bray. It was adopted as a package um, and it changed life. Um, there significantly. I'm also showing Scarabay because um, I feel this sort of, uh, in, in terms of the organization and the building of it, it's also similar in a way to Marawa, although much, much later. Um, for those that have seen it, it is, of course, one of the most amazing um, sites that you can imagine. Um, I also, um, I'm showing it because, of course, child excavated it as well, and there he is on those two things. Um, so, uh, you know, as a as it points out, you know, in, in this panel, um, Gordon Child was, of course, an Australian prehistorian and Australian archaeologist. Um, and he, um, he uh, in many ways, his thoughts about these big changes that were occurring um, were driven by his own, his own character, his own uh, personal history, but also where he was living in and um, where he's writing his books in Western Europe in the mid 1930s and early 1930s. The teleology of child is interesting because what, of course, he's looking at is he's looking at um, how we got to where we are. But when he's asking that question, he's asking the question about we are um, really in reference to um, recognizable, identifiable states, which more or less seem uh, um, understandable within Western Europe and North America in the uh, early decades of the 20th century. The teleology which he's deploying is not um, reflecting on other forms of social and economic um, formation. And I'll get back to that um, later. So that allows me then to move forward um, and to discuss. So we've, 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 we've discussed a sort of more, the larger global picture. Um, and then um, we, we can move into something which we say Marawa and the glocal Neolithic. Now, I use glocal somewhat tongue in cheek. I'm, I'm as a blend of global and local, I think 
it, it's probably been overdone and maybe it should never have been done in the first place. But it's sort of a nice, um, nice word to, um, to introduce some of the things I'm going to talk about, the way in which local and global factors seem to be, to, to be at play on the island of Marawa. So, for example, all of those settlements which we talked about before in the Fertile Crescent, stretching into Europe and eventually stretching, of course, into, into uh, uh, Scotland uh, and the British Isles generally, um, um, you know, were based on agriculture. Um, were based on agriculture. Agriculture was seen to drive um, this process, even though we know that, of course, more recent research in, in Central Europe and Germany, for example, has shown that the agriculture, this spread of agriculture could also be quite negative. Um, we, have, we have good evidence for um, fairly uh, brutal um, uh, attacks upon the early near the villages, um, fighting warfare, which, which was leading to um, the attempted sort of destruction of, of, whole, of, of, of entire villages and their populations. Um, something which is emerging from research uh, with the linear Bund ceramic cultures in Central Europe. So, but agriculture is, is the key there. Now, the first thing to say is that there's absolutely no evidence of agriculture um, in, in, in the MR11 or, or the other Neolithic sites. Agriculture is not a driving force here. Uh, it simply isn't. Yes. Um, uh, we have date stones um, from uh, Marawa. There are um, date stones from the nearby um, island of um, Dalma. Um, but we have no reason to think that this is the product of agriculture. These could have simply been um, uh, wild picked dates uh, which were consumed. So agriculture is not part of it. We can say then that perhaps we're talking about the rejection of agriculture, and I'll come back to that. Um, in a minute, the rejection of agriculture as a subsistence strategy by the people living on these islands at this time. Um, the question is, how long did it survive? Well, um, actually, I'm going to come back to this. But um, as I said, when I was discussing the architecture, it's fair to say that that these, uh, the, the village, if we like, of Marawa 11 existed for hundreds of years, um, you know, maybe over a thousand years, we have radiocarbon dates which, which drop into the early fifth millennium, which you can see here. Um, so uh, if we go back to, you know, if we, it's always difficult to work out duration, but, but these are long standing settlements. Um, I think that's, that's, the, that's the takeaway from the top and the lower end of the radiocarbon dates that we have. We also know that there was incredibly um, uh, refined, um, uh, stone tool production, um, the, the lithic assemblage is very homogenous. Um, the general shape of the arrowheads shows a very careful production of trihedral points. Um, but also, of course, this stuff is, is not naturally available on the island. So these beautiful arrowheads and other, other stone tools um, are, are, are indicate that the people are engaged in um, uh, trade, local regional trade with other islands and, and the mainland. Um, of course, of Abu Dhabi itself. Um, the the, uh, the other, many other artifacts were found um, it, on, on the excavations. Various stone artifacts have been found indicating a fairly um, rich sort of craft tradition, which we, we could, I think for some of these, we could talk about a, a, the emergence of craft specialization. Something which we see, of course, is generically um, consistent with the Neolithic period elsewhere in the Near East and, um, and the world, um, but also something which I think is emerging uh, as, as one of the, the sort of highlights of, of the discoveries there is a, is a painted plaster tradition, such as we can see here with these beautiful decorated painted plaster vessels, something which is relatively, I think, difficult to do. They're made of locally available lime and gypsum, and you can see they're decorated. They, they, they represent sort of one form of specialization I guess, um, decorated with locally available pigments. Um, uh, but also what, what's interesting about these is, uh, of course, that they, uh, for, where, where they have been found before, people assumed that they were um, something to, um, uh, somehow related to the importation of Ubaid ceramics. And as my colleague, Noor al Hamili has shown, um, this is unlikely to be the case, um, that this represents an indigenous or autochthonous uh, craft tradition which emerges at this time. Um, it should be remembered that, that these uh, islands, that this period in, in the UAE is a ceramic, but 
who needs ceramics when you can build um, such beautiful plaster vessels? So if we think about Marawa in the broader um, Neolithic world, we can see that um, in terms of the package, which does make its way across the Middle East and does make its, make its way to, to South Asia. Um, for example, we see it already um, implanted in um, Mergar in Baluchistan. We see it spread across the Mediterranean all the way to the British Isles in, in an area which is relatively close um, to the fertile crescent. Um, we can see a very selective um, adaptation of the package. Yes, domesticated animals were utilized as part of a nomadic pastoralist um, uh, tradition. Um, there is experimentation with Neolithic architecture. Is this a borrowed idea? Are they, are they conscious of the fact that villages were being built elsewhere or had been built and were continuing to be built? at this time? I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. And I don't think we know or, or we can answer that question. Is it diffusion or is it is there something which is driving the human desire to stay in the one place um, for an elongated period of time? Um, at the same time, they reject things. Um, they reject agriculture. And there'll be many people um, here who would say, yes, they obviously reject agriculture um, because um, growing crops was not possible. Um, but in fact, it should be remembered that during this period, there was more precipitation um, than there was later. Up until about 4000 BC, there was elevated amounts of precipitation. Um, now, whether or not at what time of the year it fell, um, whether or not it was um, reliable as a, as a form of precipitation for agriculture remains to be investigated. But it, at the same time, to sort of favor the idea that this was an active rejection, um, what's sometimes referred to as negative consumption, is, um, is the fact that later on, um, by about 5,000 years ago, when there was certainly less uh, rainfall than there was during the Neolithic period, um, people did practice agriculture, mostly in the inland, but they were certainly able to do it. So it's interesting that agriculture did not, was not a, 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 a adopted so much. And so why was this the case? Why was it... What was the economic or subsistence drivers which, which encouraged people to make this unusual decision to, um, uh, um, uh, to, to set up shop and to, to build houses and not just one or two houses, but to live in these houses over an elongated period of time? Of course, you know, one question is, was it all year round? Well, we don't know that, but, but a substantial amount of time, it seems. And Dr. Mark Jonathan Beach's um, examination of the fish bones has certainly suggested that it, from that evidence alone, there was good evidence that it was close to being year round. Um, and so what I'm gonna suggest is, um, is, is uh, an approach which um, allows us to maybe think about this region in a different way. And you know, this, this might be an idea which has some um, traction um, and it might also um, simply reflect um, a, 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 a very specific set of factors and in a, in a, in a, in a, on, on a group of islands. But I would say that for, for a long time, um, we have attempted to understand um, the Neolithic period by focusing on terrestrial resources, in particular agriculture, by focusing on those resources and the development of those subsistence strategies, which makes sense to the largely Western constructed scholarship, which, which has um, created the narrative around these events in this region. Um, what that narrative has not so much engaged with is the locally available resources. And so is it possible that not just on um, the islands of Abu Dhabi, um, but that in other coastal areas within the Arabian Gulf and indeed elsewhere, that there's not only, that we should not only see a relationship between the Neolithic period and the Fertile Crescent, but we could also start to see something like the Fertile Coast and example of it we've been talking about now. So why is it fertile? Why, why we, we don't think of coasts as being particularly fertile for the reasons that I have um, outlined already, but it is fertile. Um, one of the things which we, we, we need to more fully understand is of course the changing sea levels. Um, which existed around Marawa at the time. Um, obviously, the island may have been more like an archipelago connected to other islands. I'm, I'm of the opinion, I, I'm, I know that there's others out there who feel strongly about this in, in a multitude of directions. I think we just need more work on this issue to fully understand it. Regardless of how we tie down the exact conditions, we know that the marine um, 
marine uh, resources which were available were very rich and they could sustain human populations. Um, there's simply uh, uh, no issue that you know, the, the, there's, there's smaller fishes, there's large fish um, um, present here. Um, th there, is a, there is a range of resources which, as I said, could sustain human occupation in terms of fish. Um, I see some examples here. Um, some of the cluster of very small fish bones found in one of the buildings. Um, they also uh, exploited marine mammal remains, so animals such as dugongs, which we found in... And also fishing itself, for small fish, we, we have a, uh, various um, notch net sinkers um, found here, which indicate um, this sort of shallow water um, fishing, which we can see the illustration of um, on the bottom left. All of these resources combined, along with the terrestrial animals, which could be hunted with those very finely worked arrowheads, um, along um, with bird life, which would have been hunted as well, um, along with the domesticated animals which existed here, those things um, created uh, 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 the right sort of resources to encourage sedentary life, to create the, the ability to live there and to survive, and not just to survive, it's never about survival, but, but to thrive over a thousand years or more during this um, Neolithic period. This, the, the exploitation of the sea also, of course, provided other resources which could be traded. Um, uh, most famously, uh, perhaps uh, Abu Dhabi pearl discovered in room five of Marawa 11, upon its discovery, the earliest known pearl yet discovered in the world, that those resources create the possibility of economic engagement with adjoining regions. So in a sense, um, those, uh, the fish, the, the resources, sorry, the resources provide subsistence, but they also provide um, the means of um, economic exchange for resources which might not be available along the coastal um, um, areas. All right, so what happened? Well, um, uh, we know that it existed for a while, um, but how do, we, how do we understand this? this um, how do we understand this settlement within the sort of broader history of the region? Uh, basically, the question is, how does a brief period of sedentary settlement, brief as in a thousand years, maybe or more, affect the society in the long term? We could argue that it strengthens social bonds. It, it does create that sense of place, that sense of identity, which is rooted to the land. I think it would also create and strengthen um, social relationships. And of course, those social relationships are strengthened not simultaneously, but most importantly, as we can see at Marawa with these multiple stratigraphically complex dwellings, those social bonds exist through time. They become intergenerational. And that intergenerational is, is of course, driving, driving identity, um, uh, the, the, the bounds of identity over the long term. It's possible that, that uh, we can see, uh, or I should say first, that it, it's also it's, it's also the case that uh, living in one place for a long time um, uh, permits a really in-depth knowledge of the sea. And this becomes, of course, that in-depth knowledge of the sea becomes absolutely fundamental to later periods in the history and uh, archaeology of the UAE. Um, and we might even see this coming, um, um, the, the importance of this emerging after uh, at the final stages of the Neolithic period, um, after 4000 BC, where there is serious challenges um, being leveled at the coastal populations which exist as the climate changes. And you can see at a site, for example, at Akab, a communal site of the fourth millennium BC in Umar Gawain, that the, um, that, that the necessity for um, common cell activities, for food activities, becomes an important part of reaffirming um, um, identity and as well as creating networks along the coast. Here, for example, in this quite well known massive um, dugong slaughter site in Umugawain. So I think that there is an important aspect to this set. And it's, it's not a blip, it, it, it's something which is establishing um, social, um, economic um, identity, but also fostering resilience and knowledge for the challenges which were to lay ahead and which of course could not be predicted um, at, that, at the time these um, settlements existed. So my conclusion is sites such as Marawa provide unparalleled information on early selective adaptation, experimentation and somewhat rejection of the Neolithic package. 
that food production centered on the rich maritime environment and the abundant seasonal resources available. Um, the populations actively adapted and reused the environment. They were never passive inhabitants. Um, they had a footprint. They created a, a, a sense of spatial identity. Um, and they also created a society which was flexible and resilient and able to respond um, to challenges. And here, I just wanna come back, of course, um, uh, to the point of the Neolithic revolution in the, the Fertile Crescent, um, when, when Child um, was writing his book, uh, his thoughts on this, and of course, he, it was not him that came up with the idea of the Fertile Crescent, it was Breasted, um, the Near Eastern historian at Chicago, but he, he, uh, Child was not writing, obviously, in the Neolithic period. He was writing later, and he was observing the emergence of states in, in, um, in that region. And for us, our challenge is to is to obviously acknowledge that, but at the same time to try to focus um, on the relationship to what we see later in this environment, um, in this uh, uh, cultural context, which is different from what we see in places like Mesopotamia and Egypt. And to use that sort of theological device to look backwards and try to understand what was the significance of, of the Neolithic um, of, of the Neolithic period on these islands, in particular, this, this period of settled life. What's the future? Well, excavations will continue at Marawa um, and other islands in the coming years. Um, our work will focus sorry, on better understanding of the archaeology of both the terrestrial and maritime life during the Neolithic period and later. And we're very lucky, the whole team of people that works with me, um, uh, we're, 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 I'm, I'm lucky to work with such amazing people, but, but also the work, I'd like to thank the continued support and encouragement of the Department of Culture and Tourism. Um, there is such enthusiasm um, for archaeology under the chairman, His Excellency Mohammed Al Mubarak, the executive director of the Historic Environment Department, Rita Ayun Abdo, and the director of Historic Environment Department, Jabba Al Neri. And I would like to um, end um, where I begin, where I began, rather, which is to acknowledge directly the many people that have contributed the hard work on this project Mark Jonathan Beach, Nora Hamid Al Hamili. Richard Thorborn, Howard Cutler, Ahmed al Faki, all of whom are on these excavations. I wish I had more time to be there, but, um, but I, I honestly believe that the work that, that is being produced on these islands, the work that is being done on, on, in Abu Dhabi generally, but particularly in this Neolithic period on the islands, um, it, creates, uh, uh, it creates an intellectual joy, which you can see on the faces of the archeologists who, um, at the end of a very long hard season here and that sort of um, intellectual uh, joy is I think um, something which we have to keep in mind and um, it, it reminds me of the intellectual joy that Gordon Child and his team um, experienced here in 1930 on the Orkney Islands. Thank you very much. Peter, Peter, thank you very much indeed for that. You're welcome. Um, throwing out some a, a very useful and interesting and well articulated summary of the work on the site that you've been doing. Um, really impressive, but also contextualizing the findings so well and even throwing out some some new ideas there. Uh, so that's a very valuable and useful uh, talk, and I thank you very much for it. Um, I'm you're pretty welcome. sure. So, yeah, thank you. So I'm pretty sure there'll be some questions. I've certainly got a couple myself, but I can uh, some we've got James White. I'll read this out of the chat if it's OK. Uh, James White was asking the economy society explored seems to be maritime in nature. Uh, would a different one be found inland near the mountains, more akin to the Fertile Crescent? I, I, I mean, if that's OK. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's a great question. And I think um, like we have to we have to just position the history of field work here um, and say that I would not at all be surprised given 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 how much work has gone on um, um, but over a relatively short period of time I would not at all be surprised if if there were not um, um, if there were not uh, some sort of possibly agricultural or at least substantial sedentary villages discovered in the inland um, of the UAE, that 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 would not. It's difficult to find with the sedimentary history next to the mountains. Be, maybe they could be quite deeply buried. But I, um, it, it's the same. 
it's the same issue that, you know, if, if 15 <clears throat> or 20 years ago, if someone had said you would find um, substantial Neolithic villages on the islands of Abu Dhabi, people would say that's unlikely. So I would always say, you know, it, it, it could well be the case that similar um, things will turn up in the inland. Thank you. I mean, um, I'd just like to say, I mean, as we know, at the end of the, the Holocene wet phase, um, as we move into the so-called dark millennium or the fourth millennium, um, we know that occupation along this coast pretty much disappears. Yet it continues um, from Aqab and Ras al-Hamra and round the eastern coast of Oman. Yeah. And I think you yourself have argued in your book that, that the maritime resources are what sustained that area. So what was different there to, to, to the, the, the fertile coast that you, you, you've described to us here? You think? Uh, yeah, I think so. You're right. It, it seems to be that the East Coast is, um, is uh, um, maybe more of an extensive refuge during this period from 4000 to 3000 BC. Um, and it, it might be the case that because the coastal plains on, on the east are closer to the mountains, um, that there are smaller niched environments which are closer together, and that creates uh, a greater mosaic of resources to sustain um, um, people than existed maybe on the sort of flat coastal desert areas of the west. So yeah. it's to do with the proximity of the mountains and the alluvial plains. Um, and, you know, of course, as, as, as you ascend uh, the mountains, are you changing uh, these small, in, into these small ecological um, niches, um, which, which provide the diversity of resources? Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's a very different environment if you go there today. Um, from Gillian Moss, we've got, I can't read her full name, I think it's Gillian Moss, but we've got, have you done much climate work in the UAE? And if so, how does it fit into the picture? Well, I'll let you go with that one. Yeah, there has been a lot of climate work. Uh, not uh, by a whole um, team of researchers. I think the principal scholar here is Adrian Parker has been doing a lot of work um, in looking at, at climate, um, looking at, at the, uh, looking at the, um, well, I mean, first of all, so the, 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 the UAE climate does not exist in isolation from the rest of the Arabian Peninsula. So there's been a lot of work done in adjoining regions as well, um, which indicates there's this onset of this um, Holocene climatic optimum period, maybe um, around 8,500 uh, BC. I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with the exact recent dates it changes, um, which goes then to around 4,000 BC. So there has been evidence for that climatic change. The period I'm talking about at Marawa is certainly um, uh, wetter in average terms. Um, and there's also been some climate work by Adrian Parker and others looking at periods um, more recently in the Bronze Age looking at evidence for um, uh, periods of aridity around 3,000 years ago um, um, and periods of aridity around 4,100 years ago as well. So yeah, there is a, there is a developed climate uh, understanding of the climate, but, but we, well, there's, there's always more um, refining of that, that needs to take place. All right, thank you. We have a comment from Patricia Ferry. The, the similarity in the stone tools um, shown to those in Britain is astonishing and I think that's a fair point. Um, are you a comment on that or? No, no, just to say that I, I also find it astonishing. I, um, I'm, um, and I think, you know, as archeologists, we of course, we're always looking down and that's our job is to look down at the ground, but um, both, both uh, in actual terms and in intellectual terms, we have to look up and look across the oceans and, and countries and sea and I, I similarly I um, I was um, I was looking at some recent archaeology of the Ness of Rodka also on the Orkney Islands and was struck uh, precisely by the similarities to something you'd find from Marawa and I think this speaks to ultimately the the shared human um, intuition about solving problems and creating tools. Yeah I uh, I think Rob I think oh, I've just spotted Rob Carter's got his hand up I think um uh, Rob. Hi. Um, thanks very much, Peter, for that uh, fantastic lecture. Oh, um, right, Rob. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the Ness of Brodgar. I was actually going to ask you exactly that question about whether um, you thought there were any similarities there, but you, you've already mentioned it. So I'll ask a more general question anyway, um, which is, I mean, why, why is there a village on, on Marawa in the Neolithic? It, there's there's very limited space, very limited opportunities for 
many of the subsistence activities that we associate with the Arabian Neolithic, I mean, they, 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 they can happen there, but it's, it's, it's quite a small area for a, a village of that scale. So I, and I don't have any um, interpretation myself for this. I'm just curious and I'm wondering if you have any insights on well, I think I think there's there, I think there, there's several things. There's, first of all, that we, we don't know what would have existed. We don't know the size of the island during this period. Of course, it might. We well, to, we do. I mean, well, we, we've got a rough idea. I mean, we know where the sea levels were, and we know it wasn't much bigger than it was now. And possibly the island plateaus themselves are isolated from each other. Well, well I mean, one of the was smaller. One of the things that we're we're looking at, Rob, is to revisit some of that data. And uh, uh, part of the last excavations conducted by Jonathan Mark, uh, Mark Jonathan Beach, was involved geomorphologists to look in more detail at the exact issues of sea level change at that time on the island. I, I, I defer to uh, the experts on this sort of stuff. At the same time, I feel that the solidity with which previous statements have been made about the island and the uh, level of the Arabian Gulf need to be challenged and um, and reinvestigated. So I wouldn't feel comfortable saying what it would look like during this period. So, um, uh, and I think that caution is absolutely necessary. Um, so um, we, uh, to come back to the other question, I think it's it, why, why there is, um, well, uh, I think there are a lot of resources available. Um, uh, you know, that, that, that to me makes sense. Um, Feeding, feeding you and your family is the most important social activity that we do. Um, and those resources were, were plentiful. Um, it's hard for us, it's, some of us at least, to imagine such a strictly pescatarian diet. Um, mm. but there are other resources available as well, of course. Um, the other thing to say, Rob, is that we're not, uh, I'm not necessarily suggesting, I don't think anyone in the team is necessarily suggesting that everyone is sitting in those houses 365. 24 mm, 7 yeah. yeah that there is that, that there is uh um that there is a um um that there is a um uh, a flexibility and as as dr mark jonathan beach pointed out um there are three neolithic settlements um and that, that it is a biodiversity hotspot i think that's that's mm. where thank you for that mark um put it in a more succinct form than i suspect i did so yeah it, it is a and in the same way you know like that we that people think of the fertile crescent as a biodiversity hotspot it's just a bigger one of course um even though now we're starting to sort of disentangle that whole concept thankfully mm, okay thank yeah. you thank you very much Rob. fantastic well if there are any other questions maybe peter we can say um how great it is to see uh, the abu dhabi government investing resources in such an important site and and the work that's going on is clearly of a, a high quality can you give us some sort of indication of the, the? I mean, you mentioned that you're going to be looking at some other areas of the site. Can you give you? Can you give us some indication of what the next steps are and how much longer this is likely to continue? Well, you'll just have to invite me next year to the AGM, and I'll be able to fill you in on the details, Derek. Um, no, I mean, I, I we we have planned excavations um, coming up um, at the end of this year, uh, very soon, in fact, um, and the beginning of next year. Um, the, the strategy for excavating archaeological sites like this is obviously to, to reach a point of a, um, and to not exceed the law of diminishing returns about information. That is, we don't need to excavate the entire site, but we're, we're not at the point yet where we feel that we fully understand what's going on. Um, um, uh, and then when, when, we, when we start to feel more confident about things, and I think through, through Mark uh, Beach's work, we are feet we are definitely feeling more confident um then then we would leave that site and move on to other um projects within the region but i could i can um assure everyone that i mean the 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 support um which exists um uh, within the Abu Dhabi government the department of culture and tourism for continuing this work is is uh fantastic and it's um it's it's going to drive a lot of new research and a lot of new excavations and a lot of new discoveries that's great to hear, Peter. Um, so uh, I'll finish off then by um, by thanking you for for an excellent talk, uh, a really enjoyable and informative talk. And I'd like to thank the seventy five or so um, participants who attended. It's great to be that have that feeling that we're really communicating around the world and um, spreading ideas and sharing ideas. Um, hopefully, we'll see you back, all of you, at the next IASA lecture. Uh, I can't actually tell you off the top of my head where it's going to be, but uh, there's a lot of interesting lectures running up all through the year. 
uh, in, and culminating in the seminar for Arabian Studies in September, in uh, July, uh, which is going to be held in Berlin, but hopefully blended so that online as well. We're looking at that mm -hmm. at the moment. But I'd just like to thank everybody uh, for turning up and I look forward to seeing you back at uh, the next IASA lecture. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, um, um, everyone. And uh, thank you to the foundation for um, um, inviting me. I've, I, I've appreciated it. And uh, thank you very much for the questions um, and your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. You can leave now, Derek. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.